Well, hi there, racing fans, and welcome to another edition of Winning Ways, where we've got a tremendous show in uh, store for you today. And um, we're going to be chatting to Justin for Mark from Green Street Bloodstock. He's going to be talking to us in your call, telling us how his business is going and how it's going along there with uh, uh, the business that he's got, Green Street Bloodstock. And on top of that, we've got a full show because uh, we've got to talk about the Kentucky Derby, the uh, start of the champion season, all types of things going on. And uh, with me in uh, shot, none other than uh, Kevin Shea. KB? Hello, James. Good to be here. Um, yeah. First time we've seen the sun in a couple of days. Uh, close to 200 mils of rain in Durban we've had this weekend while well, you've been away. So you didn't have the rain where you were, but we had, a, we had floods. Well, I, I see that it uh, looks like we might be under a bit of pressure to race at Scottsville on Wednesday. Yeah, apparently um, what East Coast Radio said this morning, that they only had between 10 and 12 mils, which I find it very hard to believe. East Coast Radio is a Durban based Exactly. Program. Maybe that's why they, uh, no. they didn't Do they know it anything out. about marriage? They don't know anything about it. But anyway, okay. um, and the good news is we watched Leicester get uh, the trophy and yeah. have a party for one week. Uh, well, th yeah, that's great news for Leicester. But what happened to Man U? I see they might not even make the top four. Well, you know, one point behind City. We've got one more game. We've got, we need Arsenal to pull their finger out mm. and then we'll go from there. Is that so? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I'll tell you what. You're not even going to make uh, Europe next year. Well, you're we'll going to make be playing it. in the chat in the in the what the second league. Whatever. We'll win the FA Cup yeah. first, and then and go we'll to Europe. If, we'll see if Van Gaal stays with you. Yeah, Do you think we'll he's have... going to stay? I think he's going to stay. Yeah. Uh, and you're happy about that? Well, uh, there's nothing I can do about it. I've, I've, I've <laughs> suffered the pain for 18 months now. I'm, I'm stuck with it now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go and have a look at three to follow. Dad, distorted humor. He's probably one of his best sons at stud. All oh, have another wins the derby. All have another end of Lilacs and lace, 48 to one upset. He's just a big, strong, leggy horse. Right, let's go and have a look at our three to follow. And we're going to kick off with a maiden juvenile plate at the Vol Tuesday the 3rd of uh, May. And we picked the winner here. Uh, very, very nice filly. Beautifully bred. And uh, let's go and pick her up at the start. This filly will win some races, Kev. Yeah, she's by Redute's Choice. Owned by Sheikh Hamdan. Kellen Murray comes out the gates fairly well, James. I think it knows what it's doing. Kelvin gives it a little shake up. I mean, Callum gives him a little shake up. Um, the betting suggests they knew something back from 28 to 10 to even money. And um, he gets it in such a, a, a beautiful position. He's got no horses really in front of him. He's got a clear run all the way through. And uh, if you watch uh, James, we, we watched early on, she does change her legs a little bit. She's, she seems to be um, staying on the near four. I mean, the off four uh, for a long time of the race because Callum has got her, her head to the side a little bit to the left. So you'll see it now changes left. But... Uh, when it gets going, she's, this, is, this, this is something special. Yeah, Light Indigo is making the play on the inside. And the, the interesting thing about this filly is, as you say, she changes legs. She just seems to stumble a couple of times. She doesn't really seem there. She yeah. bobs her head, doesn't really know what Another it's one all there, about. And here she legs. changes back again, not really in control of um, her, her action. But here, changed back onto the all four and uh, quickened the way very nicely. This filly could be very useful the, the way she won. Yeah, one smack uh, behind and that was race over five, six lengths. So uh, one to watch uh, the Mark de Kock uh, uh, two-year-olds are starting to come out. Well, he certainly stepped out a number already, but let's go and have a look at uh, Gravel Polytrack. Mike stepped out another one called uh, Ke Keada, which they ended up backing. <coughs> and 
it um, ended up getting beaten by the horse that had the, the win under the belt, the run under the belt. But the horse that we picked up is the horse that ran third. Small field, let's go and pick them up at the start. This was a maiden juvenile play Wednesday, the 4th of May, 1400 meters. Uh, yeah, just cruised in. Just cruised in by just as well. Um, Warren comes out the gates a little bit sluggish. He's, you can see he's in no sort of a hurry to, to chase his, uh, these, these fancied horses. Paperback Wright is doing it very, very hard. He's a lovely, lovely colt of Dean Canamayas. And uh, the one-eyed uh, horse of uh, Mark de Cox in the Sheikh Hamdan colours is Anton. There he's, in, he's in front, just, just barely in front. And Anthony decides to take it over there. And the horse that we're watching is in the green second last, one off. And Warren's just nursing it along. They're going, uh, I think, quite a, quite a good gallop for a, for a 1,400 metre for two-year-olds. But... Uh, Second last, Warren's there, one off the fence, a lovely position to be in, first time, and not looking to, uh, um, to, to give it a bad experience. They turn for home now, and if you, if you just watch the front horse now with Anthony Del Pesce on paperback writer, really quickens away from them all, three, four lengths, gets away from them, the top of the straight. Uh, the one-eyed horse of Anton Marcus decides to come to the outside, you can see Anton, he's you got to watch him, he's, he, he, you can see he's battling about. The horse we're following is in the middle of the track and here's Warren Kenny, just giving it, gives it a, 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 a two little smacks behind. Uh, it's li a little bit green, and uh, gets between those two horses over there now and, sh and shakes it up, but they're really, really making up ground on the, on the, on the winner, the venture winner, but I think that's a very, very, very encouraging run. And speaking to Gavin and um, uh, Warren Kenny afterwards, they think he's a, he's a nice sort. Yeah, just as well as started off his uh, career as a stallion, looks like he might be quite useful. Just yeah, listen, as well. once and, they um, start winning and that, then people start buying yeah. and they get good mares. Uh, let's just hope it's, it all works out. And it was bred by Shadwell, which is interesting. Shake um, Hamdam, yeah. Yeah, so the, uh, they bred it and obviously sold it. Gavin bought it. And um, Gavin's been very big on these just as well. So um, let's have a look at this one. I think that he might have proved to be quite a nice horse. So he's certainly worth having a look at in the future. But the third one we go to, we go to the Vol, Thursday the 5th of May. And um, 1,400 metres, watch away this filly wins. She absolutely doddles in. Uh, blue light convoy, trained by the Alexanders. It had a run, but it really improved a lot from that first run. Let's go and pick him up at the start. Yeah, blue light con convoy, a lovely filly by traffic guard, um, Andrew Fortune. You can you watch this, Andrew Fortune. Sell. It comes out, James, like it knows what to do. You can see it's had a run. It comes out, it's got its ears pricked. Andrew Fortune in front is nothing better than you when, when you see Andrew Fortune on a horse in front. He's, He's one of the few jockeys that always keeps a little bit in the end for the death. He's, you never ever see his full, hand, his full deck of cards in a race, you always know. But he's three, four lengths clear there, but a double handful. He's really, really traveling. And he's got a couple of them behind him the, the first time, as you can see, a little bit green, running around a bit, a few of them off the bit. They, they're scared to take, on, take him on early because I think if you try and take him on early, he's just gonna, they're going to fall in a hole. But as they move up to him, you can see Andrew gives just a slight. They're going through the 600 meter mark there now. That's three furlongs. They have still a long way out. Every horse in the race is off the bit except for Andrew. And as they're working their way, as a rider, you can see as they're working their way to get to Andrew, he just keeps at one length, just keeps shifting away from them, shifting away. Now the sticks come out, panic stations all around them. Um, it was back from 22 to 10, 18 to 10. There while Andrew still got a little bit in the tank, gives a quiet little backhander. And the poor guys, they've been trying for 600 meters to try and get past him now, and now it's, he's broken their hearts now. He's still got a little bit in the tank. Looks left, looks right, he knows it's in the bag. And uh, the others look, <laughs> look like they got tired to me. Well, what was interesting about this race was that it was about half a second faster than the Colts race on the day. And the Colts race looked very competitive. Times to me are very important. And um, you've got to believe that the way this filly won, <clears throat> she'll probably go on and win some more races. Definitely, the Gary Alexander <coughs> stables, they, they always leave a little bit in the tank and Andrew does a bit of work there and must probably gives him confidence as well. But um, that's one to follow, guys. There's three horses there, three to follow. They're very nice. We're getting into champion season. You don't know, they might even be coming down here soon. So. Um, who knows? Uh, three very nice horses. We'll certainly have a close look at them. We're going to go and move on and have a look at our blast from the past. We've got a very interesting race. Kev will be able to tell us more about it. Soft falling rain, pulling clear. Soft falling rain, won the SA Nursery by three. 
racing. Racing in the 2000 Guineas. Gates fly and they're racing in the Godolphin Mile. They're off and racing. Weight didn't matter. Fast tells, soft falling rain, much too good. Soft falling rain, an impressive Guineas winner. Soft falling rain is drawing clear. He's made it seven out of seven by winning here today. But it's soft falling rain who is powering away. We'll see out the mile in style. A high class performer wins the day of Joel Stakes. Abington 2000, 500,000 rand, start to hit the lever. Runners sent on their way from the 2000 metre marker, and Goat's gonna tuck in at the back of the field. Mars Star has gone off to lead them. Zirconium's right there shortly after the start with Jet Goddess. Mother Rush is at the rail. Gilmore Girl only a half length off them as Kiribati goes wide out to circle in and be among the leading group. Behind that one is Bedloe's Island and then Consensual. Gypsy's warning's a little bit deep in the early stages. Eight or nine lengths off them, then Shake's Duel. They're being followed by Night Stalker. Love Torn is on the outside and then comes Goad. Golden Skold is second to last and Bastille Bell's the trailer. Kiribati a length and a quarter. Gilmore Girl second, then Jet Goddess. Behind that one is Mars Star in fourth position. They are being followed by Mother Russia. Gypsy's warning still hooked deep, about six lengths off the leader. Then Consensual. They are followed by Bedloe's Island Star Safari Night Stalker. Then Love Torn, Golden Skull Bastille Bells, about nine, ten lengths off them. Then Shakes Duel and Goat continues to trail about 12 lengths off the leader. The Will Abington Field moves towards the 700 meter marker. And that leader is still Kiribati by a length from Gilmore Girl Mars Star. Gypsy's warnings only a length and a quarter off the leaders as they come to the 600 metre marker. Zirconium's on the outside of runners. They are followed by Jet Goddess, then Bedlow Island Consensual. Then comes behind that one the Golden Scold. Zirconium and Gypsy's warning moves in now. Down the inside, Kiribati tries to fight back. Down the inside, Marstar. Zirconium goes by. Gypsy's warning is trying to fight back. But it's Zirconium in front. Gypsy's warning's got a little to come. Mother Rush is running on from behind. But Zirconium's doing enough. And it's Zirconium to win it. Second placing Mother Rush. Gypsy's warning third, then Jet Card is behind that love torn Kiribati. Well, if I'm not mistaken, the uh, uh, indemitable style of uh, KB Che. Yeah. He gave the outside to nobody. Nobody. There was the good old big track. He's a have had a lot in hand, that horse. A lot of the, uh, looking at the field yeah, in front of me, not a very, very strong field, but there was some nice. In the betting Control, market, Mother Russia. yeah, Mother Russia and a couple of Gypsy Warning. There were some <laughs> good fillies there, but um, that was the furthest she ever won. Uh, James, uh, there was always a stamina doubt about her, and uh, she drew ten out of I think fifteen or sixteen. We used to get full fields in those days, and um, and Mark said you've got to commit to this filly, get her up as handy as possible, and if she stays, she stays. If she doesn't, she doesn't. And Chris Haynes and Gary Grant and company, uh, the good ones, uh, they got a Group One under the belt. So I was very happy for them, but. Um, I think that was the last race she won. She, I think she might have gone for the July, ran a place, yeah. as she's, as I mentioned, by a big city life, and I think then went off to stud and done her career. Well, certainly was a good plum to watch, and um, well done, KB Chain. Nice to relive, relive the days of the past, these uh, famous days, and uh, certainly Gravel's changed quite a lot since then, uh, as you've seen. But let's go and have a little break. We've got a race uh, to uh, that you're going to be having a look at, and we'll be back with... Um, Plum of the week.
still being ridden hard is towards their outside and Kenny Trix now starts to run on nicely. Meantime, Attenborough has slipped into the lead as they come down to the final 300. Sergeant Hardy is flat to the boards and finding no more. It's Attenborough is out in front and he's going on well. Now Elevated is setting out after the leader but he has three to make up over the final 150. It's going to be too much. It's Attenborough in front. Elevated chasing hard behind that but Attenborough goes on to win it. Atten uh, goes on to win well. Elevated back in second. They were followed by Kenny Trick. Sergeant Hardy stopped to a walk and in behind them was Dancer. Well, why we picked this out is firstly it was a minor feature, but the price of this horse was ridiculous. He was seven to two at any time on Interbet, as much as you liked. Um, he won his last start comfortably and looked like a horse that really would improve. And they, they backed Sergeant Hardy like there was no settling in the race. Um, but this was the right horse in the race. Yeah, by Western Winter James, uh, just a beautiful looking individual and an action like that. Mm. When when Double D, which Donovan Dillon, uh, Joey calls him Double D. I don't know if it's from a brass size, but I don't think he calls him Double D. It's like some lager that he drank in Newcastle. You maybe, know? yeah, that maybe, that's maybe that, yeah. yeah. But uh, when Donovan, uh, he's riding very well down there. When he pushed the button, boom, race over. But the action just blew me away. Uh, doing one stride to the others behind him, doing two. I think Jay Ramsden's got some very nice horses, and I think this one's certainly well worth having a close he, look at. He has, he has declared. He's got some very nice two-year-olds for the Eustace. Uh, um, I'm sure one or two of them will be in the float and coming up for the feature races at Marisburg coming up soon. Certainly this horse looks like one to have a close look at, but really the price of Interbet was a well worth having a tasty touch at. We're going to move on and we're going to have a look at uh, current affairs where we've got some very interesting news. Yes! If you love soccer and you play the tote, you won't believe what Interbet has to offer you. All the excitement of tote betting on your computer or your cell phone. It's simple. Choose your teams and your bets, work out what your combinations will cost, see how big the pool is, and place your bets. You can even track your bet live as it happens and get updates on your progress. It's all the fun of the tote on your phone. So what are you waiting for? Sign up now at www.interbet.co.za and you could be a winner. Right, well, there we go. Are we ready to go with Abba Sherry, the graduate of the week? And uh, so he should be. Um, this, uh, uh, this horse ended up winning the third leg of the Triple Down Crown, the son of Go Deputy out of that very good race mare, Donya, bred by Lamas Kral. And uh, as you can see, the Finfurens, Michael Azzi, Carl Zechner. But this is a Bloodstock South Africa graduate of the week. And uh, he won the classic. He well worth um, the triple crown winner. And certainly we chatted all about him last week, but he deserves to be the graduate of the week. Uh, although they also had legal legal come from that cell. But let's go and have a look at uh, what we've got. We've got uh, a couple of big races from KwaZulu Natal, the start of champion season. And what a start it was, Kev. You were here. Yeah, absolutely uh, fantastic. Um, I don't know if the rest of the country saw what we saw while you're on course, but they had a opening ceremony, uh, we had the three feature races, it was absolutely magnificent, a beautiful evening and the rain just held off uh, until after the last race and then the rain came down, but it was very, very well done to Gold Circle, it was a great introduction to the champion season and like we've said on the show a couple of times, I think this year we're going to have a special season, there's some very good horses in town. Well, let's go and start with the first one that we saw, which was the Drill Hall Stakes. Now, the Drill Hall Stakes is always a warm-up for a lot of horses, but there are a couple that are prepped for the race uh, because they're seven furlong, 1,400-meter horses. And this year was no different. Horses are looking for bigger things later on in the season. Let's go and pick them up at the 1,000, and we'll chat about them after. The trailer, eight lengths off the lead in the Independent on Saturday, Drill Hall Stakes. And it's New Predator, the leader. Legislate in the blue, two lengths away, second. Then Night Trip, the conglomerate, followed by Gold Onyx and Saratoga Dancer. 
Then Mr. Matchett, Triptyque and Diamond King, Ice Machine waits eight lengths off them with Punta Arenas. They homeward bound and New Predator the leader. Legislate comes out for a run a length and a half to make up. Then the conglomerate, Gold Onyx. Down the inside, Mr. Matchett. And it's New Predator still by two. Legislate's asked to get off to the leader. Saratoga down to the outside. Ice Machine's trying to get into the race. And it's New Predator though. And New Predator still goes. Triptyque down the inside. Ice Machine's late. But New Predator, they're not going to get to him. And New New Predator will win it. Second will go to Triptyque. Third Ice Machine and Saratoga Dancer. Well, Johan Janssen van Furen opened his uh, start to the KwaZulu Natal big season, but Waishong Mowing, he's got to thank for that ride. That was a tremendous ride from the front. Yeah, absolutely. It never looked like there was going to be pace in the race, James. So there was always that we were thinking Legislate's going to follow and, and, and New Predator's going to sit in behind them, but um, just to be, just to clarify, Justin uh, Snaith came back after the race and when he went to saddle Legislate up, he looked at him and he said he had his head on the floor and he, he didn't know what to do. He, he can't go and scratch the horse now, but he says the horse wasn't right and it, and it ran accordingly. Um, he was the only horse backed in the race and uh, he just said, I, I don't know what's wrong if the horse hasn't travelled from Summerfield down here, well, but he, did he have a headache or something? Something was wrong with the horse. He, he knows the horse. He walked around the parade ring, they dragged him around the parade ring. Well, you could see Justin was a bit concerned and uh, he ran accordingly, but uh, not taking anything away from Washong. Uh, great ride, took it to the front, uh, 56 kilos, a three-year-old. Everybody is asking the question, why was he running, not running in the guineas? He must have drawn in Marriott Road not to run in the guineas, because on that he would have won the guineas, mm. I, I personally think so. Three-year-old winning the Trillor Stakes, um, I'm open to a correction, I don't think it's been done too many times. Well, it certainly was an extremely good win. It looked like the right race. Triptyque ran a great race in second for yeah. Brahm and the team. Yeah, Dennis Dry, as I mentioned earlier, he looked fantastic in the ring. And, and, and the question mark is, uh, does he stay the 14 or mile? Where are they going to go with him now? Yeah. And there's a chance now on that on that uh, run, there might be something else in the tank from. Ice Machine? Ice Machine, I thought he was a little bit out of his ground. Still looked like at one stage, halfway down the straight, he was going to maybe carry on going through with it and, and maybe win. but. He just laboured the last little bit, but a very good run. He was he made up a lot of ground. He jumped on terms that he just seems to be just losing himself in the race. But when they get on a bit, James, they, they get clever, these old horses. They just they leave themselves, they look after themselves. And if Brandon Congan push his head off for 1,400 metres, he's got to be ridden a little bit cold. But he ran a great race. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's maybe one or two more runs left in him. I'm sure he's gonna he go to a lovely home. He's been a gentleman of the of the course. Right, well, we're going to move on and have a look at the first leg of the two three-year-old features, which was the Phillies Guineas. And um, a, a really, a really good race this was. Um, Justin Snaith might have had a miserable half hour before, but he certainly came to the fore with the next two Guineas. And uh, this filly, Bella Bella, has got a very big reputation. She got injured in the float on her way down for her first start, but she certainly put things right here. Let's go and pick him up at the 1,000. No pace on. Silver Mountains near the rail. Yellow Cap got seven or eight lengths to track down. And they are followed further back in the field at this stage by Bella Bella. And then we drop back to Intergalactic who's got about eight or nine lengths to make up with Lala. As they move to the 600 in the Daisy Phillies Guineas. Our Destiny's the leader. Bella Sonata the Black Cap. Negro Mara's on the outside. They are followed by Killer Woman. Further back in the run is Flying Eye, Chatouche on the inside, and then comes Alexa. Silver Mountain's going to need running room, goes through down the inside with the yellow cab. Our Destiny leads at Negro Mara. Down the inside, Bella Sonata, and they're followed further back there by Silver Mountain, got two or three to go. Nightingale's on the outside. Negro Mara still leads it though. Running on is Bella Bella, and Bella Bella comes from nowhere. Bella Bella takes off, and it's Bella Bella. Bella Bella's going on to win at Nightingale second, Negro Amara ran third, and the fourth place to Flying Eyes. Well, if I'd said to you before the race that uh, Nightingale would beat uh, the favourite Silver Mountain, and I think six months ago, the Baz would have thought the same. No chance. Never, ever, ever. Silver Mountain ran below her, 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 her cape form. No, there's no doubt about that. But Inara was like it, James. Anara used to come to Durban and couldn't get out of its own way. 
take her to back to Cape Town, the Windsor Group once, and has gone to Joburg and won uh, big races. So she she could be one of these fillies. That are, but it's first time at Cravel. She's had a little gallop here. I watched a gallop a couple of weeks back. Yeah, easy gallop. But she knows the course, and, and it's below par. But, I mean, Bella Bella, Anti Del Pesh, he never hit her anything. Uh, Top-class ride and a top-class performance. But, as you say, Nightingale's going to get a nice little... Uh, a look from the handicapper just to bring it back to two. I think 107 was Bella Bella. Yeah, she'd certainly go to 100. I would have thought um, she's got to go somewhere around there. But um, she's certainly a big improver as well because the way she ran, she's um, she ran a really good race. Let's take nothing away from Bella Bella, owned by Fast Fontaine, and um, she beautifully bred. Um, she she really is a top filly. She is she's nothing special to look at, James. A little grey filly walks around the parading, does her own little thing. Uh, no, nothing flashy, and but ooh, when you see it produce those kind of goods. Yeah, well, she's bred by the um, yeah. She's out of the mare Mystic Spring, you know, yeah. who's a very, very good uh, brood mare. Yeah. And um, as I say, Dynasty to the fore again. again. Let's go and have a look at um, the Colts Guineas. And um, here, Silvana had his cho chance to get in the race. Uh, the homebred, Alec Foster bred. Um, Black Arthur, and what a winner he was. Well, look at him when he turns into the straight, and you tell us if you think that he could have won from here. A really, really good win. Black Arthur, 10 and 11 lengths off them being niggled at. Further back in the field is Baritone. He gives them this 13, 14 lengths. And it's Sylvester the Cat that has won the battle. Exeter is second at the 800. Rabada perfectly placed at the rail. On the outside, Celtic captain. Then comes Prospect Strike. Further back in the run as they turn for home, Royal Armour. And then comes Ten Gun Salute, the homeward bound in the Cannon Guineas. Exeter is the leader, Celtic captain, Sylvester the Cat. Rabada is going to go through. And Prospect Strike on the outside. Prospect Strike, Rabada on the inside. Celtic captain Exeter also running on his red carpet captain Mumbo Mimes getting into the race late Rabada on the inside Mumbo Mime prospect strike Baritone's coming through powerfully now Mumbo Mime and Rabada Black Arthur exploding through Black Arthur's coming at them all and Black Arthur won it Black Arthur from Rabada maybe Mumbo Mime and Maluk El Maluk Great win and he deserves to be favourite for the July. He's uh, certainly moved up the betting boards to be favourite. He'll be better over the 2,200 metres, and I think that he's the right horse. That's what the, that's the distance he's looking for, James. Uh, Thursday, I think he was back from 50 to 1 to 12 to 1, and then he won that race. I mean, that was goosebump material. Mm. And he hands and heels to the last, um, last 50 metres, and he really won a good race. Uh, uh, the second horse, Rodaba, I spoke to Mark Azzi. Mark Azzi says, Rodaba hasn't come down yet to look at the lights. Believe no. you me, he's a serious runner today. And I've always loved him. He's always been a favourite no, horse of mine. He's favourite horses. Yeah, and, and Mark Azzi always said to me, um, the other horse that won the Triple Crown is better than Rodaba. I said, Mark, I want to see for myself. I want to see for myself. And he, he was right. So, well done to Mark. Um, member man, Dean Canamare. Good run. A very good run. A very honest horse. And mm. 10 gun salute for Duncan Owls. Keep an eye on this horse. He's a, very, he's a serious horse. He's not 100% fit. Uh, ran a very good race. He's like a uh, length and a half behind the, the top horses. All right, let's move on. Kentucky Derby, Nyquist, uh, eight out of eight, five group ones. Yeah, that's something special. As Americans find him, I'm sure he's going to be Dubai banned. Can he win the Triple Crown? That's the next thing. Well, it's, you know it's not easy, but they'll have a go. They all said by Uncle Mo, he might not even stay the Kentucky Derby distance. He absolutely won very, very well. The second horse was a bit unlucky. Just a few figures on Kentucky Derby. $192 million in wagering on the day. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> and um, they were up 376,000 people went to Kentucky Derby a week, up 3%. Nyquist, five group ones, as I said, Mario Gutierrez, how's this for a record? Two rides in the derby, two winners. He won on um, uh, Flower Alley's son, I'll Have Another. You know, yeah, Flower Alley received right. Mary Slack. Yes. He won on that in 2012, I'll Have Another. That run the first two legs and then did a tender just yeah. before the, the big one. And uh, Doug O'Neill, the trainer, is fantastic for them. Yeah, we'll have to just keep an eye on it to see if he's... Is he going to go for the triple crown? Yeah, absolutely. He's so, on his way today to... Um, to the next stop. To the next stop. Yeah. Quick look here, we've got timed up, but we're going to show you, have a look here. This is the Mayor's Sale, uh, Michael Holmes, Bloodstock 2016 KZN, Premier Mayor's Sale, another Premier Sale. 
15th of May, you've got to be at Summerhill Stud, Moy River. There's services to Lingaris, all types of things. Some nice mares there, and um, that's what's happening. But um, we've got a great week's racing ahead of us. We'll be back with Justin for Mark. Let her right. Well, racing is um, a sport that needs young blood. And um, we've spoken to Justin for Mark before on the show about how he was going to go about his business and what they were going to do. And he gave us some pointers as to uh, what they do, Green Street Bloodstock. But I thought that we'd get him on the show today and get an update as to how it's going with Green Street Bloodstock. How's it going, Justin? Yeah, James, very good. Thanks for having me, first of all. And um, I think it was about two years now when I first came in and uh, we had our, our first runner, Miss Nightingale. And uh, about six months after that, that obviously gave us a bit of a PR boost and we grew to about six or seven horses. And we now currently, with yearlings we've just acquired, sitting at 37 or 38 that we race in our syndicate. So it's, it's grown tremendously over the last year or two. That's a big, big jump in two years. So there's obviously a market out there of people that want to get involved. Yeah, absolutely. There definitely is. Look, I mean, you, you yourself frequent Australia very much. And I mean, you can tell the guys when you go to the sales or to the races or to the track, how many syndication operations there are running there. I mean, there are plenty and they do fantastically well. They selling 5% shares at $10,000, which means they're buying $200,000 horses to syndicate. We at, in this country don't quite have that huge amount of owners. We're trying to build the pool up. Personally, we're doing it ourselves. We brought in a lot of new owners. But uh, we've had to start at a, in a lower bracket, but we, you know, we bought a horse for 360000 at the National Yearling Sale um, that Mark de Kock is going to train. And uh, we spent just under a million rand on our six purchases. So we're slowly getting the buying power up, and, and with that should come a higher quality of horse. Okay, well, now explain to the uninitiated out there how you actually run a syndicate. How does Green Street Bloodstock run a syndicate? What are the costs involved for the initial purchase? What are the costs involved down the line? Let's say we buy a 100,000 Rand horse. Yeah, well, you know, 100,000 Rand horse, the, the purchase price of the horse obviously determines the, how much a share is going to cost. We, shall, we sell general shares at 10%. That's what we label as a share. Um, an average, our normal horses have about six to seven owners. Uh, there's the odd one with 10, the odd one with two or three, because generally you get someone who's going to look to take 40, 50%. But we work at about the six or seven owners per horse bracket. Uh, all the owners get full race day benefits, full o owner benefits. They get their name in the race card, which is something I've recently done with the NHRA. They don't have to be licensed color holders to get their name in the card for publishing reasons. So you now see in the race card, instead of it saying Green Street Bloodstock nominee J for Mark, mm. it's got Green Street Bloodstock with all the owners' names in the brackets. It just gives the guys that are paying the bulls the extra kick because when they're sitting at home showing their friends the horse in the race card, it doesn't help if it says Justin for Mark, it looks like I own the horse. So my name's disappeared and the owner's names are in there. That's, a, that's very innovative mm. and something that um, the Jockey Club has not been very keen to do because they want the fees for all the owners to get registered as colour holders. So yeah. you don't have to be a colour holder to join Green Sea Bloodstock. Not anymore, no. I went uh, about, I think it was four or five months ago, after a lot longer than that, trying to innovate the change. And um, Jenny Buckle and Colin Hall at the NHRA, I went and sat with them and they were very, very accommodating. 
And um, yeah, they're the ones that are putting in the extra, the extra work on their database and their system that side to accommodate us getting our owner's names in the card. So I mail Jenny every time we have a new horse saying, look, this is the owner list to publish. Can you please put it on the database? And then she, her team of computer engineers and the whiz kids back in the back room, they go and edit it per horse. So it's, it's a bit of extra work for them. But you know, I mentioned the benefits of getting new owners in the game. I think the, the official color holders dropped by a huge number of like 20% last year of, of color holders that didn't renew. And uh, that could have been something that's benefited our growth as well because people now maybe don't have the funds and the means um, to own horses in their own right. And you know, they still want to stay involved, so they grab 20, 30% shares. And uh, luckily, we, we out there enough and we have getting good results, so uh, people are coming to us. Justin, let's talk about the costs involved as the ongoing costs for someone that wants to buy a share in a horse. You buy, pay your uh, percentage, you charge a fee to purchase a horse, you must charge 5% We or charge, so. yes, we charge 5% on yeah. everything that we buy up okay. front. So when someone buys a horse, they get the purchase price, mm -hmm. they get the 5% added on, they get the sales insurance, and inevitably, nowadays at all the sales, there's a, a buyer's race levy, whether yeah. it's CTS, it's the million dollar fee, mm -hmm. and um, at the TBA this year, there's sales race entry fees because they've got a couple of million dollar races on and all the other bonuses they offer just for general races as well. So that's all added on. And then on a monthly basis, what we decided to do from the start was to charge an all-inclusive fee. Uh, we take out insurance policies on all the horses and uh, a brilliant hospital medical care type plan. Uh, so wind ops and knee chip operations, that type of huge bill can be 15, 20, 30,000 rand, and it can sometimes leave you with, unfortunately, a dead horse. So we had a perfect example after the two-year-old sale last year. We bought a, we bought a horse, owners parted with 50,000 rand for the horse. Uh, three weeks later, the horse unfortunately had colic and died on the operation table, uh, leaving the 50,000 rand investment now gone and a 30,000 rand vet bill that I had to now go to new owners and say, look, you owe me 30,000 rand to pay the vets, but the horse is gone. Two things would have happened. We would have lost our owners, the new owners. And secondly, we probably got, we would have got footed with the bull from the owners that have run away. So, you, you know, we don't want to sink our business. So it looks after the owner and it looks after us. It does make the monthly fee a bit more expensive, but for 800, 900, 1,000 rand, depending on the value of the horse, I think it's more than worthwhile. And we also guarantee all the vet bulls because as you know, as a trainer, vet bulls can be a phenomenal cost. And you say to a person, look, 10% uh, share is going to be a thousand rand a month. Next thing it's 15, 1600. You know, the guys get a little bit sour because they don't know what they're in for. And then it looks like you're trying to charge a bit too much or whatever the case may be. So we just went all in, all inclusive. Um, I spoke to Manfred a good couple of months ago, just about vet bulls in general. And they had done a big case study over a number of years, a number of horses, just trying to work out the average vet bull per horse. And it comes to about between 1,500, 1,700 rand a month per horse. And uh, you know, that's, that. that's your annual, your like race to race maintenance type stuff. So I did a, after we had a big string of horses over six months, I added up all our vet bulls divided by a number of horses and it came to about 1,600 a month. So all in all, that's, you know, that you're looking at nowadays, unfortunately, that's the expense. Uh, we want to race a horse. You're looking at 11, 12,000 Rand a month to race a horse. So, so you have a training fee, let's say 10,000 Rand. You add on another couple of thousand for the vets, medical, the insurance, insurance etc. all those type of things. Correct. 12 Rand a month. The guy knows that he's in for Correct. 1,200 Rand for his 10% every Absolutely, month. Absolutely. Yeah. He can pay you. Does he pay you up front? We have guys that pay up front. Um, and then we can approach a trainer if that happens and say, look, we've got, a, we've got this training fee up front. Uh, do we get a 10% discount, discount type of thing? I don't like to hassle guys for discounts because, you know, I, obviously working for Main Chance, we've had 25, 26 trainers. I know how hard it is to be a trainer and to make a living. So inevitably, we, do, we don't really do that with the guys, but sometimes they offer. If you pay a year up front or whatever, we can give you a bit of a, a piece off. So we take up that option. The vets are very good with us in that regard as well. If we uh, pay well and keep credit, then they help us out as well. So that's what we do. It's, it's something that we decided we're going to do from the start, all inclusive, no hidden costs, instead of you know, trying to come in, coming up with month end surprises for the guys. Okay, let's go back to the beginning and talk about Justin for Mark when you started, because I remember you started basically as a jockey's agent. That's how you got involved in Yeah, yeah. I start, well, the first job was as an assistant trainer when I was uh, about 14, 15. I used to shadow John Fox during the holidays and the weekends, and then I went to work for Dylan Kuna, and then I became a full-time jockey's agent before moving to 
the jockey club as a handicapper. I think that was 21, or quite a long time ago. I'm 28 now, so seven years ago already. But fr from being a, the, the jockey's agent must have given you a very big insight into what was going on. I, th I know that you were an agent for Anthony Del Pesce for mm. quite a long time. And uh, to be an agent for a top guy like that, mm. a lot of pressure? Yeah, a lot of pressure. Um, the guys say when you start working for big jockeys like that that it's easy and the trainers are phoning for you but they're phoning you for rides but you it goes but you you know normal jockey you're trying to get riding fee for the guy and get him on rides but when you're doing rides for a top jockey then you're faced with choosing between three or four horses in a race that can win possibly a horse that he's he's won on two or three horses in a race and now you have to choose the right one so that's where the pressure comes in but yeah i did anthony's rides for three years um when i think it was 19 20 around about that time before i became a handicapper but then uh, when I left, I took I started with Smunga and Bernard, yeah. and I was uh, Smunga's agent for three years, I think, as well when he won the championship and and all the had the big race winners Wagner, Heavy Metal, and that whole string of Group Ones that he had. And we went to Ascot to the Shergar Cup together, so that was quite a quite a grow, growing experience. But I gave up the agent side of things about eight months ago now, six or eight months ago, just to concentrate on Main Chance and Green Street and. Um, I recently got appointed to the board of directors for the Racing Association in the Western Cape. So a lot of things going on and I just thought, you know, I didn't want to be a 50, 60 year old jockey's agent. That was just a, a, a way in the beginning to get out there and get the experience and experience different facets of the industry. And uh, yeah, now concentrating on, on other things that we can grow more than being an agent per se. Tell us a bit about main charts. Yeah, main chance. Um, I started now four years ago, I think three and a half years ago. <laughs> and uh, we've been very fortunate every year. Obviously, I'm the racing manager. We've recently taken on Tim Gwitzma to be the stud manager. He replaced John Slade, who was there when I started. And I think he'd been there for 12, 15 years or whatever the case was. Um, and yeah, Tim's taken over. So I handle the racing side of things. And then we all work together at the sales and with stallions and that type of stuff. But the racing is my baby. And we've had a Group 1 winner every year since I've been there. We, st we had Bilateral and then Pine Princess. <coughs> and um, obviously this year we had Silver Mountain as well, who, who ran a bit below par. We were talking off air about her. Um, yeah, she ran, no excuses. She pulled up fine. She scoped clear. She's 100%. Bernard and I went to see her the morning after the race. Just one of those bum runs. She didn't quicken in the straight at all. Anthony and Bernard were next to each other. Obviously, Anthony was on the winner the whole race. And Anthony, funny enough, I mean, Bernard said that he had mentioned to Anthony coming around the bend, oh, we're going to run first and second, see you at the finish. Yeah. But uh, Anthony's also quickened and, and Bernard's didn't. So that's just racing, I'm, I'm afraid. And I had a few discussions with people about the filly going forward. And I personally felt, I've had a lot of heated arguments with people, but I personally felt that the filly is overrated by the entire racing public. She won the filly's guineas very well, which she did. And I think that's stamped in people's minds. But you got to look at what horses are beating. And she beat what, what was a merit rated 89 in second, Our Destiny. Our Destiny and yeah. Tafferty Tart was in third. Mm -hmm. They're decent horses. But... I don't think between them they've run a place yet. And then she took on the Colts twice, and in both occasions, the, the, the Guineas and then the Million Dollar, she only managed to beat Victorious J ahead on both occasions, receiving two and a half kilos. He hasn't exactly set the feature race season a lot. So your people were saying that on form she should win the Guineas, but I disagreed. I thought Bella Bella on form, because if you look at her paddock stakes run, she was three lengths behind Smart Call, one length behind Inara, and she beat same jurisdiction, who was in fourth. Yeah. Uh, Silver Mountain hadn't taken on nearly the quality of, of what Bella Bella had run against there. So Bella Bella is beautiful filly. You could see on the way going to the start, she just looked a division above. And uh, I'm not saying that was Silver Mountain's run. She's much better than that. But um, I think it might have just taken a bit of pressure off the horse. And uh, hopefully she can now come out and earn the reputation that she, she got early by winning another group one. Would she not be, as most of the Silvanos are, more effective over 2,000 meters, that type of trip? That's, that's the inclination you get, especially out of that mare, because, I mean, that mare's produced Helderberg Blue by Jet Master, who stays. Careful Hiker was by Spectrum. Uh, she went a trip. And obviously the latest one is Cloth of Cloud. And that mare, we're talking about Mystic Spring, that mare, Our Table Mountain, is every time she produces a bomb without fail. And being by Silvano, you've got to expect her to go 2,000 meters um, going on further. But she's, she's a very small horse. Uh, she's nothing to look at in the parade ring. And um, I think she's going to go 10 furlong long term. Whether we go with Lavington now or look at you know, the Garden Province, 
we've got to trust, we don't want to run a horse that's not absolutely well now stretching her 10 furlong after she's run a race like that in the guinea. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk to the bass operation and we'll see how she goes in the next few weeks and then make a decision from there. But in the, in the you know, talking about her in terms of a career, it's still early days. She's still got a four-year-old career and in our same jurisdiction, smart call are gone. There's Bella Bella and her now, there's the Paddock Stakes, the Mallorca Stakes in Cape Town, her hometown. So there's, there's a lot of racing. It's not all doom and gloom after one run. How do the farm feel about racing horses uh, longer term? I know that in, um, certainly in Germany, um, the operation runs horses uh, longer than most people do. You know, most people want to curtail horses racing careers when they're three years old. But uh, the Jakobs seem to be lovers of racing and they seem to, to love to race their horses, which yes. is a good thing. Yeah, correct. Andreas loves the racing side of things. He's an avid breeder as well, obviously, owning three farms around the, around the globe. But um, he loves the racing. And generally, we try and limit a three-year-old to seven, eight runs in a season. He doesn't like to run them more than that. Um, but they definitely race as four-year-olds and sometimes five-year-olds. Just It depends on each horse, the temperament of the horse, if they start souring to racing, that type of thing. But uh, this filly, uh, despite you know the progeny of the mare being quite uh, hot, she's she's got a bit of the Silvano I'm stamped on to her, and she's quite chilled. So she's definitely going to race as a four-year-old, um, obviously all things being equal and fair, but uh, possibly a five-year-old as well. well. We'll have a see, but she'll definitely race next year. Being involved in the farm, I know John Slade, you know, we've grown up together. He was a fantastic man and, and it's got to be a loss to a stud too. Um, is he still involved in the day-to-day? -day? Does he still give you guys a hand? Or? No, 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 we haven't. John, um, obviously, massive loss to the farm. Someone who was part of fabric of the farm for many, many years, over a decade. And uh, yeah, Tim's come in. Tim's a super talented guy, young guy. Um, and he's going to have a big future at the farm if he stays on. But just, John's been a miss. Uh, he left officially at the end of December. So okay. Tim's been managing the the day to day running since then. Uh, we saw John came around to book one. We are selling one or two horses and to Joburg as well. We saw yeah. him at uh, the TBA sale. But he's um, permanently based at his farm at the Crew, okay. where um, his wife has been living for many many years. I think she was. I don't know if she was happy or upset to have John back on a day-to-day -day basis at the farm, but I'm sure they've got, we know to what you they've got to know each other again, I'm sure. So they're breeding out there, racehorses, so Good. I'm sure they'll be selling at coming sales, so it's not the last we're going to see of him, thankfully. Just talking about the stallions on the farm, obviously Silvano, you ran one, two, three in the July last year. That's a huge, um, it's a huge win for a horse. But he is just one of those horses. He now looks like he's got the favourite for the July again this year. Yeah, he's a phenomenal horse. Um, funny enough, Monty Roberts, who breaks in all Andreas's horses in Germany, uh, broke him in and taught him how to be handled by human beings and that type of thing, which has led to him being the most docile horse. I mean, in, the, in peak covering season, you can swing on the back of his tail and walk between his hind legs. And that used to be one of John's party tricks when visitors used to come to the farm. And he's just completely not phased at all. So he's a, he's a phenomenal gentleman. He's getting on in age, 20 years old now, I think. So he's having his mares limited this season um, to try and get the best out of him in, in his last years. But uh, yeah, we've, we, you know, the stallion game, you've got to try and find the new ones. and. We're hoping in Kirari, who's a son of Oasis Dream, who's had a phenomenal start. Uh, he had a stakes winner this year and a few stakes places from his second crop. We're hoping that um, he's there to take over the mold. Obviously, Blackman Alusha has been there and done that. And now we've got Vercingetrix as well, who's a son of Silvano and probably the best performed son of Silvano on a racetrack. Yeah. Uh, Bolt Silvano has had three winners in his first crop uh, already this season. Um, and Vercingetrix, we're hoping that he can go on to maybe uh, re replace his father at the farm. Justin, let's just talk generally about racing because I know you're an aficionado as far as racing is concerned. A couple of things that um, are really interesting. There's, there is a big debate about handicapping at the moment. Have you been involved in it? Uh, in yes, yeah, we've been involved. Listening, obviously, it's a keen interest of mine and being a racing manager, we have to know the loopholes and the, all the, how everything works so that we can use the system to our benefit and make sure that all the horses are you know, you can get the most out of each horse. But they recently had huge changes um, to the handicapping, you know, the protocols, if you'd have it. They've brought in a lot of them. You were talking about Nightingale in that race. Mm. Um, 
Well, one of the new protocols that they brought in was that uh, the horses are, have restricted penalties for running places in group races. So I think she can only get six pounds. Oh, okay. Uh, something, the six or eight, somewhere around there. I don't know offhand. It was only a few weeks ago that it came in. But I think she can only get a six-point penalty, Nightingale, after that. Okay. The connections can... Um, request the, the higher yeah. rating if they yeah. want to qualify for a race like say the July mm. so then they can ref take the 104 whatever she yeah. ran to yeah. or they can keep the six and run in a handicap next time obviously um, that does make it look like it's a bad change but you, you are going to get the horses that you know go through the cracks like that but from the other side of the of the ball you know how many times do you hear trainers and owners moaning about a horse they've had run a third or a fourth in a group one and been booted up in the ratings and then you know have, have had no career after that so there's going to be one or two benefit from the system but I think a, a good example would be our destiny she ran 89 uh, often 89 went to 101 or whatever it was in the guineas mm -hmm. after if these rules were in place then she could only have gone to a 95 yes. so she she possibly still would have had a bit of a career off off that mark I'm not saying she's not going to now but it's purely an example the biggest problem seems to be chatting to people involved in racing as far as handicapping is concerned. If you have a really consistent horse who's always there or thereabouts, he seems to get that creep, which mm. keeps putting a pound or two pounds mm. on his back. How do we get, how do we get away from that? Because yeah. I don't think that's fair. Yeah, that is a big issue, especially for, as you say, older type of horses or even young consistent horses. Consistent horses. Because, yeah. yeah, you can win a race, yeah. be an 82 or an 83 after winning as a two-year-old, which is fairly common. And then uh, you come as a three-year-old and you come to a 78 or so and you're running second, third, second, third, but you, you're a one-time winner for 78. And a lot of horses, a lot of horses do, um, do lose out because of that. From a purely handicapping point of view, a horse running second and third is a very competitive horse. So they're not over handicapped. You know what they're not? Yes, they, they handicap from winning, but that's the job of a handicap is to stop horses from winning, essentially. Although it is unfair on horses like that, they unfortunately in this system are not seen as badly handicapped. It's not like they're not earning stake money and they're, they're running a long way off and uncompetitive. They are very competitive. The issue comes in where here we're running second for 10,000 Rand or 12,000 Rand and it's hardly helping to pay the bills. So, you know, if you were running second and collecting 50 grand, 60 grand, then it wouldn't be such a big issue. But that is a problem. But um, all I can say to the racing public and to the trainers and the owners is those, pro those new protocols have been made publicly available. They're on the website. They're ev you can go and download them, familiarize yourself, and then apply to all of the horses that you have, that you own and that you train. Go back to Green Street Bloodstock. Um, I see not only are you a, a syndication uh, outfit, but you also have a tipping service. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we Bernard do. Fade Herb. Yeah. Tipping is, is, is your ambassador, as it were. Like, you know, Gold Circle have um, the big guy as the ambassador. You got Bernard Fade yeah, Herb as yeah. your ambassador. I don't know if it's a good or bad thing, but <laughs> well, it's, been, <laughs> it's been a good thing so far. Yeah, Bernard is our. He's more than, he gives comments for, we, we affiliate ourselves with him. He's our retained rider and we sponsor him. So he hasn't ridden a lot of our horses at the moment because he's based in the Cape. We've had a couple of Durban runners, but we've got 19 two-year-olds to come out and run, of which you'll see him ride as many of our horses as possible. Um, but yeah, he just supplies, you know, the more information for the punter, the better. He, uh, we've had a lot of jockeys do columns and uh, work for various websites giving comments on rides. He gives, puts all of his comments on all of his rides that he has. We have them on our website and on our email service that goes to our subscribers. I do like a race by race analysis. But yeah, the tipping thing, I wasn't too sure, you know, when we started it, should it be, you know, you know, tarnished with the same brush as the syndication company. But I just thought, you know what, I'm a package, he's a package. What we're going to do, we may as well do under the same banner. And, you know, just from doing the understarters order shows and doing some teletrack gigs, a lot of people, they hit you up on social media and on SMS and you can, you know what it's like, how many people phone you for tips on race day. So I thought, let's get a service out there. If people want to use it, it's there to be used. So we have the SMS line, which is 41077, just SMS tips to that every day and the guys get all the plays. And then the, we do, we've opened now recently for internationals as well, so they can pay for our service on a, a credit card system online which has been phenomenally received. So we've got a lot, we've got guys in Ireland and Hong Kong and Singapore that, because fortunately our racing is getting beamed all over the world. And you know, they're similar to our international racing, we just get a sheet with the numbers, the names, the jockeys. So it's, it's not that much information. So we've had a couple of guys from overseas, but, but it's doing well. I'm glad we started it. It's a little bit of extra PR for us. 
And we've had a phenomenal, we tipped four or five pick sixes on the bounce two weeks ago. The Champions Day pick six for 64 and we tipped. And a huge treble last week, 251 to one. So it's all going very, very well. Uh, we've had a lot of guys, they keep, uh, the testament is the guys re-signing. Every month they come back and re-sign up. So it's so, done very well. Uh, what do they do? Do they sign for a fee? And, uh, you know, we know because we can see it in the, mm. in the advertorial sporting mm. post where you do a lot of advertising and that. But do you sign for a fee for 30 days and you get um, um, what a, a, yeah, the, an the, email every day? Yeah, there's the two options. The SMS to the 41077, that's 25 Rand just for the day because you, some guys are selective. They, only, they don't even know what's running in the Cape. They just play Joburg. They just play Natal, whatever the story is. Then you get your guys who play every day. So they sign up on, online. Hmm. Um, they pay by EFT. I think it's 350 Rand for an entire month. Yeah. And then they get a daily email every morning. The PA, the pick six, the long shots the sh the whole lot a lot of work it's a lot of work i do it every day yeah. so um, my manager who uh, works with us his name's carl johnson he does a bit of it when i'm away yeah. and he's done fantastically well as well so he's um between the two of us we do it um bernard supplies all his comments and then i do a race by race breakdown just so the guys don't know they're just watching they don't have a, a specific play in the race they'll read through and see what we're leaning towards and then play it from there and then the international guys it's 20 pounds i mean it's a token for an englishman 20 yeah. pounds for a month it's yeah. it's no money at all but we just thought let's well, kick it off rent, so yeah, for even rent. Money, yeah yeah so yeah. that's what 20 pounds for them is nothing and and um, how did you hook up with bernard fred herbie he's a he's an interesting guy bernard you yeah. know I think we met, I was 17, 18 years old. When I was doing Anthony's rides in the beginning, he was looking for someone from the Natal season. And I did his rides for about three months or so. And then, yeah, moved to Cape Town. And uh, I think we both came off breakups at the same time from our girlfriends. So we were both single. And uh, we stayed together in Cape Town. About this I can imagine yeah, what happened there. When I started with Mainchon, so three or four years ago, and that's when we became very close. Uh, we lived down the road from each other in Cape Town. And um, yeah, so we've, he's a young guy, great jockey, fantastic rider, has been overseas. One he's a great horseman, overseas. isn't he? World-class horseman. And him and his brother both, him and Robert, I mean, they, I think that's where they got very close with Neil Brass as well, was from the Madagascar days, because yeah, that's where Bernard absolutely. and Robert grew up. And uh, they used to jump on the ponies and ride bareback from before, when they could walk, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in and amongst the rivers and the bush and whatnot, bareback on these Madagascarian horses. I don't know what they look like or how they were to ride, but I can just imagine because Bernard's been a, become a fantastic horseman, a great, great rider. Obviously, his weight is an issue. Is, is his weight a, a big yeah, issue? Yeah, James is a big problem. Really He's bad. riding 58 plus a half. So. Yeah where he gets down to 58 for the big group races, yeah. but um, 58 and a half restricts you to a lot of, I know for him, he lost the ride on pocket power as a three-year-old, all those three-year-olds, Big City Life, he won all the big races on Big City Life, then lost it in the July, because as soon as they, as they go to under 57 and a half, 58, he can't ride them. So yeah. that's a big problem for him. Yeah, because he's, he's um, a guy that uh, I think really wastes quite hard to some days to get his weight right. You know, people don't really understand um, what a trial and tribulation it is for a jockey to go through the wasting process and then end up riding in a race meeting. You know, yeah. you've got to be razor sharp. And um, having sat in a sweat box or in a bath for yeah. an hour is not, not easy. No, correct. I mean, you go sit in a sweat box for 30 minutes and with, or with 20 minutes to go, you're looking to get out already. And Bernard's got kilograms to lose before yeah. races. And he's up cracker dawn riding work in the, in the sweat kit. And then he's running around Greenpoint in the heart of a Cape Town summer with plastics, a uh, beanie, yeah. tracksuit. People driving past must look at him and think, what on earth is this guy doing? <laughs> but yeah, he, and then he, after that, he's got to have a bath, no food, that type mm. of thing. So yeah, he did, he's not the only one, but he is an extreme case. Yeah. Okay, we've got to uh, wrap this up. But just going back to Green Street Bloodstock, obviously you've grown a tremendous amount. Where do you expect to go in the next um, couple of years? Yeah, how, it's, how big do you want to be? Look, we want to go as big as we can get. I put the target of like 50 horses in training mm -hmm. um, about 18 months ago. We get up to 37, 38, I think, as I touched on, when these yearlings go. And obviously you lose a few that end up bad and get shipped on and whatnot after that. But I think 50 is a good number in training. Then at, that, at least the business becomes viable. I mean, obviously people sometimes forget the fact that, you know, for people like us, this isn't our hobby. 
we don't do this for fun. We wake up at the crack of dawn. I don't go and wake up early and take pictures of owners' horses and send them videos for fun. You know, <laughs> we've got to make a living out of it yeah. at the end of the day, which is another reason why we started the tipping service, which has done well for us. But I'd like to get there. We obviously like to improve the quality of horses you buy. In the beginning, you're going to be looking 50,000, 60,000 and putting guys together. But once you've earned their trust and got results for them, we've seen it already. Next thing, you know, they want to buy a 300,000 Rand horse. So that will grow. And then um, we'd love to go overseas and, and take some of our owners to race horses overseas. That would obviously be the end game. I'd love to be able to go to Magic Million Sale in Australia and buy some horses there to race here for syndicates. So it's all about being around a bit long enough to gain credibility and gain people's trust with results and with good service. And then hopefully we'll be able to have a, a big number of horses in the 50 area and quality horses as well. And then win group races. That's what we have for a lot of people. I mean, we're not in the business of syndicating merit-rated 30 maidens that swerve to win a race. As soon as that happens, dump. Let's move on to the next one and try to get you a group horse because that, at the end of the day, is what we want. And you're getting the, um, a lot of young blood into the industry, which is hugely important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had an open day at Summerfelt on Saturday. The rain was coming, so I, I hosted at Gavin's yard and we had a big panic on Friday and we went and got a marquee. But luckily, the, the rain stayed away. Um, it was overcast, but we had... I think we had 52 or 53 people come to the breakfast at, at um, the summer Some felt the poor yeah. staff there had a panic attack. I don't <laughs> think the clubhouse has been that full in many a year. And then we, we took them to watch work, watch their horses work, and then took them to the yard. And they came to see, you know, two people like us, we take for granted horses like Red Carpet Captain and No Worries. You know, we see horses like that all the time. But to the punters and to owners who aren't involved in the day-to-day -day stuff, you know, that's just black and white on the race card for them. Yeah. For them to come and meet those horses at the stable is a whole new thing. So they came and met the horses that they owned and some of the heroes of racing. And Bernard and Gavin and I were there and we gave them like a little insight into how everything works. And they, they loved it. So that's something we'll do going forward. Open days, get more people to the stables. As I say, 52 or 53 people came and a lot of people that have never owned a horse before. First timers, youngsters. So it, it was a great success. And we'll continue to do stuff like that to try and build our, our, our owner pool. Justin, um, it's been a pleasure chatting to you. You're one of the guys that this business really needs and long may it last because um, there are many people that come into this business, get disillusioned and go, but you've, your heart's in it. You can see, you know, having had this discussion with you and really racing needs young blood. And uh, you guys do more than any of these uh, fanfare jigs that they have at the racetrack, this, that and the other, to try and get people to the race course. You are the lifeblood of racing. Thank you so much for joining us and um, we wish you well in the future. Yeah, thanks very much. I appreciate the platform to come and talk and thanks for the kind words. Hopefully we can continue growing. Well, it's always a pleasure having uh, someone on the show that is this knowledgeable and this passionate about racing. And as you can see, got jobs with some big operations. Main Chance Farm, you don't get a job with them. Involved with Bernard Fad Herbert, jockey of huge credentials. And uh, Justin for Mark and Green Sea Bloodstock certainly are a proposition for the future. If you're looking to get involved, you know where to find them. From me, James Goodman, and the rest of the Winning Ways crew, thank you to uh, Raymond and the whole team for putting the show together. We hope you have a great week's racing, and we'll be back next week.